He's wanting us to know, this is not my opinion. This is not me giving you some advice. This is what God says, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to the lewdness to work all uncleanness and greediness. And we explained a little bit about the contrast between the old life that we lived before we came to know Christ and now the new life after Christ. But in verse, verses 20 through 24, he's going to explain what all that means. And he begins to share some of those principles that we can apply. How can we walk in this newness of life? this new life in Christ. But before we follow through with that, the Lord has really impressed on me that I want to share some questions because I talked about this old life. There are a lot of people today who may think that they're really saved and, and yet they may not be. I want to share some principles from the Word about how to make sure you're really saved. How can we know for sure? Because I fear we're living in a day when the culture has so polluted the church with unbiblical worldly thinking, and the gospel in many instances has been so watered down and polluted and so distorted that I just feel compelled to share what the Bible says about how to know that you're really saved. I think way too many people have a false sense of assurance because they took time, they, they looked to a time when they prayed a prayer and they ask Jesus into their heart. Now, I'm not against doing that. There are some pastors who I've read that, that say, nowhere in the Bible does it say anybody prayed and asked Jesus into their heart. And they're right. The Bible doesn't say anybody ever did that. But I'm not a, opposed to that. As a matter of fact, Friday night I prayed with four young people. And... Uh, I mentioned about asking the Lord Jesus Christ to come into their heart to save them. But at the same time, people in the Bible aren't doing it. And I want them to realize that there is nothing magical about the prayer that they pray. It's not the prayer that saves them. It is the sincerity of their heart. I wanted them to understand exactly what they did and why. And after those kids prayed, I wanted them to know that it wasn't the prayer that saved them. It was the Lord Jesus who hears the cry of a heart that sincerely realizes that they are lost in their sin. They stand condemned before a holy God and they need his mercy. They need salvation. It's, a, it's, it's the cry of a sincere heart who realizes their desperate need of a, sailor, of a savior. For example, one man, all he said was, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said that man was justified. Or how about the thief on the cross? All he said was, Lord, remember me on that day when you come into, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's all he said. Unfortunately, sometimes people think that if they prayed the sinner's prayer or they went forward and were baptized, or many are still thinking today that if they can just do the best that they can, that they'll make it to heaven when they die. But you know, loved ones, this is one area that we cannot afford to be, to be unsure about. As a matter of fact, in that three questions that we ask, on the top is, are you 50% sure, 75% sure, or 100% sure if you were to die tonight, do you know for sure you would go to heaven? We want to make sure that they understand that you can be 100% sure that you'll go to heaven when you die. We can't afford to have a false sense of assurance. God has given clear biblical principles on which we can and we should examine ourselves, myself included. Now, I've been saved since 1979. How many years is that? Uh, 43, I think. But there are days today, you know, even today after 43 years, 
And my wife will probably be the first to tell you, my son will stand in line right behind her, that there are days that I don't act like I'm so saved. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> That would apply to every one of us. Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he's speaking to this church that was known for their carnality. They had, a, they had this temple to the goddess Aphrodite where there were a thousand temple prostitutes up on the hillside. Actually, it was kind of a big mountain. But there was a lot of immorality in this city and the, there were Christians within this city that were still falling into the temptation. And he says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. So we need to examine ourselves. We need to ask ourselves some questions from time to time. Am I really acting like a Christian? Is there evidence that I really know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? And I think it would be prudent for us to do a little self-examination today to see if we can make sure where we really stand with the Lord, not just for our sakes who are here today, but also for those who may be watching or may be watching in the future on Facebook or YouTube or on our website. Someone once said that there's a lot of people that thought they would be in heaven and won't make it, and then there's a lot of people who we think won't make it, but will be there. We don't know people's hearts. Only God knows that. But I do know this, that God wants us to be sure. He doesn't want us to be uncertain. He doesn't want us to worry. He wants us to know. Because he moved the Apostle John to write his first epistle, 1 John, and in there, he talks about several proofs about how you can know that you're born of God. He wants us to know beyond any doubt that we have eternal life because 1 John chapter 5, and verse 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. That word know is a, is a certainty. It's a, it's a strong word in the Greek there that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So there are quite a few questions in other passages of Scripture, but some of these, the majority towards the end, are going to come from 1 John, that we can ask ourselves to test ourselves. And then next week we'll get back to Ephesians chapter 4 and look at some principles about how to put on the new man in Christ. So the first question that I think we should ask ourselves is, am I sure that I've been born again of, of the Spirit? Remember, Jesus asked Nicodemus, a very religious man, a righteous man, that unless one is born of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, you don't have to remember a specific time or date. Some of you have grown up in the church and you just grew up believing, but you know, somewhere along the line, you made it personal. A Amanda testified to that when she was baptized. And it became real for her personally. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 5, that unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So have you come to this point in your life that you actually repented of your sin? To repent means to change your mind, but it also has the idea of not just changing your mind, but that change is going to result in some change in behavior. It means that you have agreed with God that in your heart, even though you may be a good person, your heart is still wicked. It has the potential to do evil things, sinful things. And you realize that you're guilty before a holy God, deserving of judgment, and you want to turn to God with a deep desire to eliminate, eliminate the sin from your life. Your repenting 
by changing your mind about thinking that you are good enough, which is the kind of mindset that most people have before they come to know Jesus Christ. Because they're trying to do the best that they can. That's why we need to realize that we need His mercy, that we can never be good enough. And so when you repent, all of a sudden you come to the realization that I can't be good enough, I'm, I'm, I'm desperate for God's mercy. Paul told the, to the Ephesian elders, he proclaimed the gospel, he says, I, proclaim, I proclaimed it to you, the gospel that is, and he taught you publicly from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 20 and verse 20 and 21. Jesus didn't offer himself on the cross to make you feel better about your life. Or to heal you, or to fix your financial mess, or to fix your marriage, or to help you stop drinking or doing drugs, or to quit pornography, or any other number of reasons that people think that they can come to Christ and, and Christ will change. Although when you, do the, when you do come to Christ for the right reason, He can do all of those things. But when He died on the cross, He died specifically to pay the penalty for a sin debt that you owed. That's why He died. The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He died the just for the unjust to take away your sin. And in return, he took your sin away and then he gave you his righteousness so that you could have a perfect standing before a holy God. To make you fit and holy to be with him for eternity in heaven. For by grace you are saved through faith, but grace does not give us a pass to live life the same way we always did. So have you realized that there is no hope for any of us apart from the mercy and grace of God? Have you received the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't have a problem with somebody praying to, to, to ask Jesus to come into your heart. John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. But going back to what I said, why did you receive him? If you received him to fix your marriage or to help you to get out of drugs or drinking, is that's, all the, is that's the only reason why you received him? There's more to it than that. Romans 9, 10, 10, 9 and 10, if you confess your sin, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So the point is, is that we have to make, mean business with God. When I spoke with those kids Friday night, I, I, made, I, I wanted to make sure that they understood that they needed to be sincere. They have, if you pray to receive Christ, you need, really need to mean it. Don't just, don't just do it with me just because you're trying to appease me. <clears throat> and if you did, then the Spirit of God came to live within you. By virtue of the Spirit of God, that's how you're born again. He comes to give you life. And He changes us And he left us here because he has still work for us to do. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of works, it's the gift of God, lest any of us should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has appointed for us. So, am I sure I've been born again? Good place to start. Number two, has there been a real change in your life? Now, you've heard me quote this verse time and time again, thousands of times. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. <clears throat> Rather, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. So has God changed your heart? 
Has he transformed you in a new creation? Do you think differently about God than you did before? Are you still doing the same old things that you used to do and don't really think much about it? Do you have a desire to read the Bible and to learn what God has to say, or do you just still keep the Bible on the shelf and don't bother with it? Because a new heart is going to want to know what God has to say. Do you have a desire to be with other Christians? The last thing in the world I wanted before I became a believer was to be around people like you. <laughs> Not that you're bad, but... But now, you're my favorite people to hang out with. Listen, friends, when Jesus comes into your life, he starts cleaning house. He begins to point things out that grieve him. You'll stop doing those things. And then he begins to fill your heart with a love for the things that he loves. And if you're born again, you'll know it because the presence of Jesus in your life is going to make a difference. If there's no difference in your life because of Jesus, you, you, you say Jesus is there in your life and there's no difference, then there's a problem. There's a disconnect there. There's an instant change when you're born again, but yet you're not perfect. You're still a babe in Christ. So there's a progressive change that continues for the rest of your life. You'll never arrive until you get to be with him. I think Walter is the oldest one in here. Have you gotten there yet, Walt? Almost. Almost? Almost. But he's not there yet. And none of us will be. You begin to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as you begin to grow, you begin to reject some of the things that you know that are displeasing to him. You begin to learn to appreciate and love the things that are pleasing to him. And, and your life begins to transform. My theology professor, Dr. Williams, used to say that when Jesus changes a life, you're going to see fruit in that person's life, even if it's by accident. And of course, some will show it more than others because even when we come to faith in Christ, we all have different levels of commitment. <coughs> Excuse me. I didn't mean to cough in your ear. But someone asked this question, and it's worth asking ourselves. If it were illegal in America to be a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? You know, we're coming upon a day when it may happen very soon. Could you be condemned for being a Christian by the courts? Has your life really changed? Question number three. Does the Holy Spirit bear witness that you are His? Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When you're born of the Spirit, He begins His ministry in us and through us. And to us. And his ministry in us serves to confirm to us that we are the children of God. He provides credible evidence that we are actually God's child. God knows that we need assurance. When Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world needs, if I don't have the, the assurance of my salvation, I, I will never have that kind of peace. But the Holy Spirit begins to do things in our life, giving us the assurance of our salvation. He illuminates the Word, and He begins to open up the understanding. How many of you will testify that you didn't understand the Bible before you were saved, but then all of a sudden, it started making sense? Not that you fully understand it, but all of a sudden, simple things began to click. And... He begins to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. Some of those characteristics like love and joy and peace and things that were never part of your character before, as you yield to Him, He begins to manifest those things in your life. 
He assured, it's the Spirit who leads us to cry out, Abba, Father, Galatians 4, 6. It's a sign of our intimacy that we have communion with God. One commentator says that the Spirit confirms our salvation, quote, in His comforting us, His stirring us up to prayer, His reproof for our sins, His drawing us to works of love to bear testimony before the world. I can't tell you what His name is because I can't pronounce it. But <laughs> the 1 John 4, 13 says, By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. So his spirit bears witness. So has the spirit shown you the evidence that you are really saved? Question number four. Do you consistently obey God's word? 1 John 2, 3 makes a pretty clear statement here. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Am I there? Oop. Oh. I'm slacking. He's not saying that you have to be perfect. But there is a desire to be obedient. And there will be a, a growing pattern of obedience. If you want to know whether you're a true Christian, ask yourself whether you obey the commandments of Scripture more consistently. That's how Jesus described a true disciple when giving the Great Commission to go into all the world. Obedience to the commands of God produces assurance, and it also produces joy. Remember that old hymn that says, Trust and obey, for there's no other way. How does it go? To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. And you know, one of the things that I've noticed in Christians is the people that are really consistent with sharing their faith are usually the most joyful. Because they're, they're actively sharing Jesus Christ with people and they're seeing people respond to the gospel. And that's a great source of joy. It really is. Obedience gives us confidence of knowing for sure that we have come to know him. Number five, are you developing a hatred for the world? 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. Now, how do you feel about the things of the world? Because this world is pretty much anti-God and it's under Satan's dominion. John MacArthur writes this, quote, The evil one has designed a system. So when we're talking about the world, we're talking about the world system. But the Bible simply calls the world, the Greek word is cosmos, it speaks of a system encompassing false religion, errant philosophy, crime, immorality, materialism, and the like. When you become a Christian, such things repel you, not attract you. Sometimes you may be lured into worldly things, but it isn't what you love, it's what you hate. You remember last week we talked about Paul and the struggle that he had. He says, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I do. That's the struggle. It was the pull of the world that he was getting sucked into. But he said, who's going to deliver me from these things? And praise be to God for Jesus Christ who gives us the victory. He's the key that's going to pull us out. We may get sucked in temporarily to these things of the world. But we should have this disdain for these things, this dislike, this hatred. Remember, Jesus said, those who follow him are not of the world, just as he is not of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of it. But that's why he prayed. Prayed that the Father would keep us from the evil one. So if we're saved, it's possible to be enticed by these worldly pleasures and attractions, but our love for God will be the key to escaping and returning to the pursuit of godly priorities. Because we're not of this world anymore. So what about you? Are you in love with the things of the world? Are they so enticing that you would rather do worldly things than do godly things? Question number six. Do you live like you're expecting Jesus to return? I gather by the way 
Walter prayed this morning. He's really looking forward to Jesus coming back. <laughs> That's a sure sign that somebody knows Jesus. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So if you're really a believer, you're going to have this expectant hope. And John says that it will be a purifying effect on your life. And we see the condition of the world. We see how it's deteriorating, how awful things are getting. And it just makes us long even more for the coming of the Lord. We eagerly, we eagerly anticipate there's this groaning within us for the Lord to come back because we see how awful it is. But it's one of the reasons also why we feel compelled to tell others because we know as bad as it's getting, the time is short. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, but it's, you know, we're told that things are going to get worse and worse the closer we get to the day. And I know that we should long to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. But he's our blessed hope. So the question is, are you really excited about his return? Because if we're really born again, we should be. Or do you even think about it? The answer to either of those two questions should tell you where you stand with Jesus. Question number seven, are sinful habits decreasing in your life? 1 John 3, 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now, literally, he's saying that he, not that he cannot sin, but that he cannot practice sin as a lifestyle. The, from the tense of the verb that he's using here, that's exactly what he's talking about. But he says he cannot because he has a new nature within him. That new nature is called God's seed, the Holy Spirit. So when a person receives Christ, there's tremendous spiritual changes that take place in him. He's given this perfect standing before God. He's justified. And he can't sin, but there is this old man that's still within him. It's the old man. Remember, Paul said there is this principle that is still within. That's the part of him that's still doing the things that are displeasing to God. And so in Romans chapter 6, Paul says you need to put, those, put the old man to death. Consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. The old man still resides in us. And we'll have more to say about that as far as putting on the new man next week. But what's happening in your life, that's why Paul was making a big deal about them not living like the Gentiles, not living their old lifestyle the way they used to. Because if you can live the way that you used to without feeling any conviction of sin, then there's a problem because the Holy Spirit lives in you for that very purpose, to convict you of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Question number eight, do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and, who, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or deed or tongue, but in, indeed in truth. Pete mentioned earlier about people down in South Florida who are suffering greatly. We have a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ who are down there. Churches have been wiped out. Homes have been wiped out. Lives have been lost. People are suffering. They're part of our family. So we need to be praying about what we can do, and we should do something. This is a passage in 1 John that needs very little explanation. 
And if you listen to my Bible study last thir- Wednesday night, rather, that's exactly what I was talking about, brotherly love. From 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. They were showing their love for their brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the whole region and other churches like Philippi and Berea and other churches. And it was so prevalent that the whole region, the whole area of Macedonia, they were talking about this love. The whole, the, the, the whole region, people were saying, goodness gracious, my, how they love one another. Look around you. Do you love each other that way? Do you love me that way? We need to love each other, just like he says here in 1 John chapter 3. Question number nine. Have you experienced God's discipline? Hebrews chapter 12. Have you ever, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For, when, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. If you are a child of God and you are sinning and you are thinking that you are getting away with it, God is going to chasten you. He's going to spank you, take you to the woodshed, if you will. And if he's not doing it, then he's saying, you're, you're not really his child then. You're illegitimate. You're claiming to be his, but you're not really. God will not allow a Christian to live in a continuous lifestyle of sin. And if you do, you'll be miserable and he'll be dealing with you. If that person is is a Christian, God is going to lovingly discipline. He does that. You who are parents, you, you, you deal with your children. You discipline them, don't you? You know, you may not spank them. I know there's different opinions about how you discipline your children, but you discipline them one way or another, because you love them. And if you don't discipline them, that's, that's really kind of a, you're not really showing much love if you don't discipline them because they're going to grow up wild and undisciplined themselves. There's a church, that church in Corinth, There were some who were being selfish at the Lord's table. And Paul tells them there, he says, Let a man examine himself, so let him eat and drink, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And then he says, For this reason many of you are sick among you and many sleep. So in other words, sickness and sleep is a, is a metaphor for death. Those were means of punishment, chastening, discipline from the Lord. He says, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned by the world. So we're chastened in this world. We're not not damned to hell. We're not condemned to eternity in hell because of our sin. But he will discipline us. And if God allows a professing believer who is backslidden to remain that way, then that's a strong evidence that the person is not his child. He's just a poser who stopped posing. Last but not least, question number 10. Have you ever suffered rejection because of your faith? 1 John chapter 3, verse 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Paul reminded Timothy, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, we live in America, we have freedom, we're not, we're not really persecuted. But if you're serious about living for Christ, I guarantee you, you're going you're gonna to take a little bit of heat, you may get some rejection. Pete was passing out tracts like crazy, I mean, I think he'd pass out more than 300 at least. Now, he didn't get any real pushback or blowback, but there were people that gave him snarky looks, and, you know, I mean, that, that's... 
Now, that's a kind of an adversarial posture. And if you're trying to do that, you'll get some blowback. And as I mentioned earlier, it's going to get worse. I just finished reading a book and I gave it to Walt. It's no reason to hide, but in there, Erwin Lutzer writes this book about where America is heading as far as religious freedom, and we're, we're heading for trouble. And Christians today are either complicit, they're complacent, or they need to be con courageous. It's increasingly becoming obvious that we're going to either stand up for the, uh, to the culture that hates us or we're going to give in to the pressure and eventual persecution. Jesus said this, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Now Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And they would all suffer tremendously because they lived wholeheartedly for him. But the fact of the matter is, is that if we do, if we're serious about our faith in Jesus Christ, if our faith is genuine, then we're going to get some resistance and some, and some harassment. Because... If our faith is real, then the world is going to hate us. So take these ten questions to check your own salvation. Peter said this, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Loved ones, God wants us all to make sure that our salvation is real. He doesn't want us to stumble. He doesn't want us to worry. He wants us to be stable and sure about who we are in Christ so that when we go out into the world, we can make a difference. And others will see what it really means to be a follower of Christ. Amen? Let's pray together. Our Father, as we have run through these questions, I pray for each one of us here this morning that we would come before you and that we would ask you to search our hearts, that you would know our anxious thoughts see if there's any wicked way in us Lord if there's anything that is really hindering us from truly knowing you Lord we just as we've run through these questions if anything struck a chord Lord I pray that you would just help us to realize where we stand with you Lord you don't do that to make us feel guilty but you do that because you love us and you want to draw us to yourself so father i pray that you would help us to make sure of our calling that we would be faithful to regularly examine ourselves so that we would make sure that we are on solid ground with our lord jesus so that when we go out of this place gathered together we can go out in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit and make a difference for Jesus Christ. We pray these things together in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. You are dismissed.